This is the Spiral Galaxy NGC 2008 in an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And here is the M87 galaxy, which is elliptical, as its appearance suggests. It's not difficult to talk about the shape and structure of galaxies we observe from afar, but it's incredibly challenging to say much about the shape and structure of the galaxy we live in. Taking a galactic selfie from within it is, to put it mildly, a complex task. Yet we have images like these. Here we see the disk of our galaxy, its spiral arms, and even a marker indicating where we reside among the countless stars of the Milky Way. The truth is that none of these images should be taken as an accurate projection of our galaxy. Its structure, including the shape and position of the spiral arms and even their number, is constantly being revised as new data on the velocity and position of stars and star clusters, as well as gas and dust clouds, becomes available. However, it's worth noting that astronomers have indeed made great strides in mapping the Milky Way, and today we know that it's a barred spiral galaxy. The only question is, how do we know this? That's what we're going to discuss. When describing our position inside the galaxy, astronomers often like to use the analogy of a dense forest. We are like someone standing within this forest, surrounded by countless tall trees, and tethered to one of them, unable to move. On top of that, the forest is shrouded in fog, preventing us from seeing what it conceals. So, understanding exactly where we are and creating a map of this forest is, to say the least, a difficult task. Why this analogy isn't perfect, I'll explain a bit later. For now, let's start with the obvious. The first thing you can do when trying to understand the shape of our galaxy is to simply look at it with your own eyes. The bright band stretching across the sky can indeed be seen with the naked eye, but only in places with minimal light pollution. For example, where the author of this channel was born, far from large cities, it was quite visible. And in fact, even in Galileo's time, people realized that this band was nothing more than a dense concentration of stars. So today, it's not hard to understand that our galaxy is most likely a flattened disk, rather than, say, an elliptical or irregular galaxy. If it were elliptical, the stars wouldn't form a band but would be scattered all over the sky. Additionally, within the starry band, you can see a larger, brighter bulge that even extends beyond the disk itself. This strongly resembles the elliptical component of any spiral galaxy observed by astronomers, a structure known as the galactic bulge. Okay, but even understanding that this all resembles a spiral galaxy, you can't be certain, as from our point of view, we only see part of its disk. For the Milky Way to be revealed in all its glory, several photos from different angles need to be combined. The two Mass All Sky Survey does a great job of showing what our galaxy looks like. This infrared image combines data collected by two separate telescopes located in both hemispheres of our planet. The celestial sphere, displayed here in two dimensions, clearly demonstrates what the Milky Way is. It truly resembles a disk galaxy viewed edge on. This is wonderful, but how exactly do we know that our galaxy is spiral? And how do we even have a map where we can pinpoint our location? It's clear that the key to constructing any map is determining where objects are located and measuring how far they are from us. However, this is very difficult to do with objects like stars or clouds of gas and dust. In fact, on a galactic scale, this was simply impossible for a long time. The thing is, astronomers of the past, particularly in the 19th century, didn't understand the nature of the vast regions of space along the Milky Way, which seemed to be devoid of stars. Historically, these were called coal sacks, which appeared as dark holes against the bright backdrop of the starry sky. Today, we know that these coal sacks are simply clouds of gas and dust that block starlight. Back then, research of the universe was conducted exclusively in the optical range, which, unlike radio waves, for instance, cannot penetrate the many clouds of gas and dust in our galaxy. Thus, it wasn't until the advent of radio astronomy that scientists could finally see what was hidden in the distant reaches of our galaxy. So, what kind of information can we gather from radio waves? Well, for example, the locations of cold and warm hydrogen. The simplest atom in the universe, the hydrogen atom, can emit energy in the form of a photon with very low energy in the radio range. This occurs due to the so-called hyperfine interaction, when the spin of the electron spontaneously changes. This is a somewhat complicated quantum mechanical effect, which, to be honest, I haven't tried to delve into in detail. But overall, it looks something like this. 
In its lowest energy state, the hydrogen atom can have an electron whose spin is either parallel or not parallel to the proton spin. The simplest way to imagine this is to think of the electron either spinning in the same direction as the proton, say clockwise, or in the opposite direction. The main thing to understand is that an atom with non-parallel spins is indeed in its lowest energy state, while an atom with parallel spins is in a slightly excited state and thus has slightly more energy. Since atoms always tend to be in the state with the lowest possible energy, the electron will eventually flip from the parallel to the non-parallel state. This transition is forbidden, but despite the word forbidden, it can still occur, though very, very rarely. Maybe once every few million or even tens of millions of years. Imagine that. Thus, when the spin changes, the atom truly moves to a lower energy state and as a result, emits a photon with a very small amount of energy and a wavelength of 21 centimeters. The 21 centimeter line from neutral hydrogen is one of the favorites in astrophysics. First, it is very precise, and nothing else in the universe produces the same frequency. So, if you detect 21 CMR radio waves in space, you know, it's neutral hydrogen. Secondly, this specific wavelength has the convenient property of passing rather freely through clouds of gas and dust. So, point a radio telescope in a certain direction, and the more intense the 21 sim signal you find, the more hydrogen you're observing. This was first done in the early 1950s by astronomers Jan Oort, Frank Kerr, and Gart Westerhout. Using radio telescopes in the Netherlands and Australia, they studied our galaxy and were the first to see how clouds of gas are distributed in the form of spiral arms. Yes, there's a lot of noise in the data, but the spiral structure of our galaxy can indeed be observed. You can also notice a kind of empty triangle, which will always remain empty, no matter how powerful the telescope you use. The reason is that the galactic bulge, a massive star cluster where stars are tightly packed together, is so bright and large that from our viewpoint, it's fundamentally impossible to observe anything behind it. Therefore, the far side of the galaxy remains hidden from us, and all we can do is speculate about what it looks like. However, judging by what we see elsewhere in the universe, Spiral galaxies tend to be quite symmetrical, so the other side of the Milky Way might not differ much from what we see here. With the development of radio astronomy, researchers finally could understand how gas is distributed within the disk of the galaxy. But they still wanted to see not just gas, but stars. Stars hidden behind dust that actually define the spiral arms. What makes a spiral galaxy spiral are massive blue and white-blue giants. Stars that shine the brightest and, in their short lifetimes, don't have time to move far from where they were born. So if you find where the stars of spectral types O and B are concentrated, you'll find the locations of the spiral arms. These stars emit mostly ultraviolet light, which has even shorter wavelengths than visible light, and thus is easily absorbed by clouds of gas and dust. But astronomers came up with a clever trick. They realized that when such stars are born, they emit intense ultraviolet light capable of ionizing hydrogen atoms around them. That is, the photon energy is sufficient to strip hydrogen of its electrons. Thus, the young star heats the surrounding gas and ionizes it, creating something like a glowing bubble of ionized hydrogen, which in fact, emits radio waves quite well. A great example of such a region is the Orion Nebula, which is the only ionized hydrogen region that can be seen with the naked eye. So, in 1976, two French astronomers used a radio telescope to create a complete map of the distribution of emission nebulae in our galaxy, such as the Orion Nebula. These giant regions where new stars are born are usually located within spiral arms, where the main star formation of the galaxy occurs. In this way, the researchers once again confirmed that our galaxy has a spiral structure, and they were able to map out four spiral arms that branch and wind around our galaxy. However, a fundamentally new level in mapping the Milky Way came with the advent of space telescopes. Spitzer, launched in 2003, unlike Hubble, viewed the universe exclusively in infrared wavelengths, and its decade-long sky survey was an unprecedented leap forward in studying our galaxy. Based on its data, a map of the Milky Way was created, encompassing 800,000 images. You can see a variety of objects here, but perhaps the most interesting is that the infrared light, which can penetrate dust, revealed to scientists more than 110 million stars. In 2008, 
a group of researchers developed software that, based on Spitzer's data, could determine the density with which stars are distributed in the galaxy. Where the density was higher, spiral arms were likely located. It turned out that areas of increased density indeed corresponded with the predicted position of the Centaurus arm. However, in the direction of the Sagittarius and Cygnus arms, the telescope did not detect higher densities. The fourth arm, Perseus, is located in the outer part of the galaxy, which Spitzer did not study. Thus, its data showed that the Milky Way is more likely not a galaxy with four arms, a relatively rare structure in the cosmos, but a typical galaxy with two large arms and several smaller offshoots. However, in 2013, another large-scale study called the Red MSX Source Survey once again restored the Milky Way's forearms. This survey is notable because it focused on finding stars that are still in the process of forming. The fact is that so-called protostars are quite bright sources of infrared radiation, even at relatively early stages of their evolution. Their heat warms the surrounding dust, which shines in the infrared. Therefore, the researchers used the aforementioned two mass sky survey and data from the older infrared satellite MassX to isolate so-called massive young stellar objects. Essentially, these are future giant stars still in formation, not yet ionizing the gas around them. Only in the future will their light create glowing regions like the Orion Nebula. By determining the distance to 1,650 such objects, astronomers produced a map of the Milky Way, once again adorned with four large, bright spiral arms. The debate about the number and structure of the Milky Way's spiral arms remains unresolved even today. This is largely due to the various methods different studies use to estimate distances. While it's relatively easy to locate star-forming regions, determining their exact distances from us is much more challenging. For this reason, astronomers have high hopes for the Gaia Space Observatory, which is currently conducting a comprehensive census of billions of stars in our galaxy. At first glance, Gaia may appear unassuming, but don't be fooled. It has already mapped over 2 billion stars in the Milky Way, and it's doing so in three dimensions. The key to Gaia's success lies in its ability to measure distances with extraordinary precision using the parallax method. The principle behind parallax is simple. By observing a star from two different points, we can measure how much its position shifts relative to more distant background stars. It's similar to how, when you look at your outstretched finger with one eye closed and then the other, its position seems to change. Naturally, the best results come when the observation points are as far apart as possible. For example, you could measure a star's position from two opposite sides of Earth. But you can go even further and use Earth's orbit around the Sun. In this case, you take one measurement, wait six months, then take another from the opposite side of Earth's orbit. With simple trigonometry, you can then calculate the star's distance. Gaia, positioned at the Lagrange point 2, orbits the Sun alongside Earth and measures stellar parallaxes with unprecedented accuracy. To put it in perspective, Gaia's precision is equivalent to observing a human hair from a distance of 500 kilometers. This level of accuracy has allowed astronomers to discover, for instance, that stars once thought to belong to the same structure are actually part of different systems. In 2021, astronomers used Gaia's data to examine the positions of 600,000 young, bright stars, creating the most detailed map of the Milky Way within 16,000 light years of the Sun. This region is only about one-sixth of the galaxy's total diameter, but Gaia's precision revealed that the so-called local arm, where our Sun resides, is longer than previously thought. Astronomers hope to extend their studies further in the future, though this is challenging because parallax measurements work only for relatively nearby stars. Stars in the far side of the galaxy might simply be too distant for any parallax shift to be measured at all. Still, Gaia is not just a tool for measuring distances, Remember the forest analogy we talked about earlier? In reality, it's not a perfect comparison because the trees in a forest are stationary. Stars, on the other hand, only seem to be still. Gaia can track the motions of stars, allowing astronomers to see how the Milky Way evolves over time. On a broad level, observations of stellar velocities show the overall rotation of stars around the galactic center, which is characteristic of spiral galaxies. But beyond that, there are stars in our galaxy that follow unusual orbits, moving perpendicular to the galactic disk. While within the disk, some groups of stars even move in the opposite direction to the Milky Way's rotation. 
This hints at a turbulent history of the Milky Way, which has been and still is absorbing neighboring galaxies, growing larger and more massive in the process. Today, we know that the Milky Way's disk spans an astounding 100,000 light years of mostly empty space. But within it are hundreds of billions of stars and other fascinating forms of normal matter. The solar system is about 25,000 light years from the center of the galaxy, meaning we are approximately equidistant from the center and the edge. Moving around the core of the Milky Way at a speed of 220 kilometers a second, it takes our star between 230 and 250 million years to complete one full orbit. Thus, since its birth, the Sun has already made over two dozen of its galactic orbits. Within the disk, which, by the way, is about a thousand light years thick, our stellar system is situated very close to the galactic equator. However, it is tilted at an angle of approximately 60 degrees relative to the plane of the galaxy. Our star system lies between two main arms, Perseus and Centaurus. But at the same time, we seem to be located on the edge of one of the offshoots, or a relatively small arm called the Orion Arm, also known as the Local Arm. This offshoot is a subject of ongoing debate, particularly concerning its size. According to the latest estimates, the local arm could be over 26,000 light-years long and 3,500 light-years wide. The constellation Orion, after which our local arm is named, is one of the most prominent in the northern sky. It contains many bright stars, including Rigel and Betelgeuse, and, of course, the Orion Nebula. The reason we see so many bright objects here is that we are looking at our local spiral arm, by the way, the fact that spiral arms appear brighter does not mean there's nothing between them. In reality, there are almost as many stars between the arms, but they are much older and significantly dimmer than their younger, larger counterparts. So, we must agree that we are still far from claiming to fully understand the structure of our galaxy. The maps we have today can be compared to 16th century atlases of the Earth. The general outlines are clear, but we still lack precision in measuring sizes and distances, and some objects are still awaiting discovery. Therefore, we can expect to update our map of the Milky Way in the future, especially thanks to missions like Gaia. So make sure to subscribe to this channel to stay updated on new discoveries.